For most of recorded American history, political power has looked a certain way. Portraits of power calling images of men dressed in suits to mind. However, after the 2018 midterm elections, when women accounted for now more than 100 seats in Congress, it was clear that change in representation is underway. But what obstacles did these powerhouse women face getting to office? And for those of you who are interested in running, what should you know before you enter the race? In a new book titled Represent, The Woman's Guide to Running for Office and Changing the World, actor, comedian, writer, June Diane Rayfield gives women a step-by-step -step guide to running. And we're delighted to have her joining us now. June, it's nice to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to preface this by saying it's a marvelous book. And I think infused with great humor, while still focusing on very significant issues. And that's a difficult balance to accomplish. So my compliments to you right off the bat. But let me ask you, <laughs> as, as first question, I'm, I'm always curious. Uh, I, I've written a few books myself. I'm always curious for writers as to why they decide to focus with all the opportunities you have on this project. And you talk in your, your introduction letter that you and Kate do about what got you to it. Give us a quick sense of that. Yeah, I mean, after the 2016 election, I, I was feeling, there's no other way to put it, just devastated and, and humiliated at Hillary's loss. And I, uh, I was considering running for office. I know I'm not the only woman in America who felt this way, but, but Donald Trump's presidency certainly made me feel like, well, well, shoot, maybe I can do this too. <laughs> um, and I did some light Googling and could not find a lot of information on, on what the first steps would be. I think that civic engagement is, is kept away from a lot of us, uh, maybe on purpose. And we, we don't, uh, well, for most women, we don't consider ourselves. And we think the process seems mysterious and overwhelming and often best left to others to do. Uh, so I really set out to write a guidebook to answer those questions that I had. Kate Black was someone I found, uh, she was the chief of staff at Emily's List at the time, and she had all of the information. And uh, so we really set out to demystify the process, to make it, yes, fun, dare I say, and accessible, um, but also filled with granular, detailed information on how a run for office could look in a very real, very full life. Let me ask you a big picture question, then we'll get to some of the specifics here. But in putting this all together, what, what did you find in terms of the, the barriers, both, both the realities mm -hmm. of barriers, and maybe more important, the perception that women have of the barriers yeah. for them running for Definitely. office? I mean, I think that there are the very real external barriers that exist, and then there are the internal barriers. And the very real external barriers are, are uh, around money and access to wealth. And having personal wealth or access to wealthy circles certainly makes the process a lot easier. Also, women have a harder time fundraising. Women of color have an even harder time fundraising than white women. And these are just facts, and they're real, and they're something to really consider. But then there are the internal battles, the feelings around, are we qualified enough? Um, the fears that uh, we're going to be embarrassed, that we're going to be sexualized, humiliated in some way if we take a step into the public arena. And the book does not dismiss those fears or say that there's not a reality to them, but we also offer women, I hope, a lot of ways to combat these internal fears and to address them. And I think ultimately by providing women with a, a checklist and a path and a roadmap, um, that they can really work and that they can really interact with. By the end of it, my hope is they're really armed for this process in a different way and that they, what they really walk away from the book with is the knowledge that they're not alone in this, that this is not something someone does alone and that they are going to be engaging a lot of people around them to make this happen. Why do you think, you mentioned qualifications, and I was struck by a couple of things in the book. One is the, the fact that, uh, that surveys have shown that even, even men who are not qualified think they're qualified. Even those who have not acknowledged they're probably not qualified have said, yeah, but I'm okay. I'm qualified to run for office. And yet so many women who are highly qualified might question that about themselves. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah. 
Well, I think, honestly, Jack, it's because we live in a sexist culture and yeah. women are not primed as leaders. Um, we we are, are not primed to believe that this is for us. I also think representation matters. And so it's hard to imagine yourself as something when you don't see men much modeling for it. Um, so I think there are a number of reasons why we're internalizing these messages and we're internalizing uh, that the, the patriarchal culture that we, we live in, we are also a part of it and, and it seeps in. So um, I think there, the first step, of course, is to identify that these are messages and just that, that this is not something inherent that's true. Um, and then work to dismantle that. The chapters are, are all, uh, they're all intriguing. Uh, they range from bigger pictures. You talk about fundraising. Where do you go to find the money? Um, you mentioned uh, Emily's List and the role that they can play. But you even focus on, uh, have a sort of a micro focus. You talk about what you should wear. What, what, what should your uniform be? Talk a little bit about that chapter. Well, that was a really difficult chapter to write, and I, I still... I'm still not sure we should have included it. And the reason why is because um, for so many women, beauty standards are, are, are complicated and uh, potentially damaging. And uh, so to write anything that prescribed what to wear for women was very troublesome to me. And yet we got so many questions when we started to, to talk to women who were considering running for office about this very subject. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them just wanted to be told what to wear and so that they could move on with the, the rest of their campaign and focus on the things they actually cared about. So ultimately what we came up with is a real how, choose your own adventure in that chapter. So if you want to go out and buy a whole new wardrobe, yes, we give some suggestions on outfits that might work. But if you want to not spend any money and time on it, we just tell women to go into their closet and put on something that makes them feel really great. Um, and if they don't want to think about it at all, then they should just move along <laughs> to the next <laughs> chapter because it is a bit of a Bermuda Triangle, uh, but, but turns out something that uh, I think is important to include because, because it is a big issue for so many women. Right, and as you said, look, we are, we are a visual society. Um, and, uh, you know, men have, men have advisors to tell them what color tie to wear for a particular event. That's true. But I think for women, you know, men put on a suit and they mm. seem powerful. And mm -hmm. for women, that, that's, uh, it's a much trickier thing to do. So we don't necessarily have that costume of power to just put on. Uh, for women, there, there's a lot of other factors that come into play. Talk about the checklists, because I, I, again, I talked about in the very beginning this infusion of humor, but, it, but it's powerful humor and, and, it, and it's informative humor. Um, talk about how you've utilized the checklist at the end of each of these chapters and how they build upon each other. Well, so we start by um, really asking women to just say it out loud and to tell someone out loud. And then at the end of that chapter, they get to check a little box. I think, you know, going through the book and checking that box and having done the work and research uh, for whatever that chapter is asking you to do empowers women to uh, feel more ready to do this. You know, so many of us, I mean, I'm, I'm one of these women. I like to know uh, that I've done all, all of the work ahead of time before I can go do the thing. But, but... Yes, there's a checklist. Yes, we thought a lot about it. Yes, I think it's very valuable. And also, my hope is that women don't use this book as a crutch, that if they are on the first chapter and think, you know what, I actually think I'm ready to run now, I hope they close it and just start, because I, uh, I don't think we have time to wait. <laughs> You know, I've, I've often believed, let's less, less, less sort of compliment for you, if I might. Um, I, when you look at where we are right now as a government, and, and I teach in, in various colleges and universities, and I said, look, our founders envisioned this as, as citizen legislators, not professional legislators. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about both sides of the aisle here. We've become much more pro governed by professional legislators almost at every level. And I, I think one of the great values of your book here, in addition to all the things we mentioned, um, learning and, and learning in a way that's enjoyable, but it also presents a Bible for people saying, all right, let, if you want to be a citizen legislator, 
uh, and you happen to be a woman, come and take a look at this and we'll help you get there. Um, that being said, if, if, what's the, the, if, if somebody said to you, okay, I, I've, I'm, inter I'm a woman, I'm really interested, what's the best piece of advice you can give me about running for office? Mm. How do you distill it? I think the best piece of advice I would give is to start talking about it. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I, that, that was the first thing Kate said to me in our very first phone call. Um, and I, I thought that was amazing because she, she said it was the first thing women should do even before they, they, they figured out where to run mm. <laughs> or what the exact requirements were for that specific seat, that they should simply start saying it aloud. Uh, so that's that's the number one piece of advice. But I totally agree with you that that the sort of promise of, of our democracy is about we the people. And that means all of us people. And one of the cool things we cool facts we add in the book is that most women uh, are running because they see a problem that directly affects them and they want to solve it. Uh, not all men, but a, a lot of men are running for the career advancement. So we should all want. Uh, people in office and or women, any gender, who are running to solve a problem that they see. And I think that idea of civic engagement, um, we're not really teaching civics anymore. It is so mysterious. And we don't often think that it's something uh, that we should do. And, and I really hope people read the book and walk away from it thinking, oh, I, I am a part of all of this that I see around me. And uh, that could mean a run for office. Now, once again, the book is titled Represent the Woman's Guide to Running for Office and Changing the World. June, thanks so much for spending some time with us. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's just wonderful work that you and Kate did. We appreciate you taking the time. You be well. You too. Thanks so much.